Hey everybody, it's Justin from Bittner Built, and today we're going to talk about building a successful woodworking business. And you're going to say, Justin, how, how are you an expert in this that you're going to talk to us about this? And while I do not have a large production wood shop, uh, I come to you on YouTube as an intermediate woodworker. That's what I am. Uh, but off of YouTube, I'm a very experienced entrepreneur. I've owned over 20 businesses that I've founded from startup. Um, I've had some horrible failures, which entrepreneurs take as learning experiences, and I've had some incredible successes too. Um, I do very well for myself and I own multiple companies. So uh, for me, starting a business uh, is very much a formula-based thing, and so I have a lot of experience in this, and I'd like to share it with you. I won't solve all your problems, but um, hopefully I can answer a, a lot of questions, especially for somebody who's looking at starting a business or has recently started a woodworking business. Um, and so let's, uh, let's dig into that knowledge together today on Bittner Bill. This is a standard thought process when starting a new business. One out of every five businesses fail in their first year, and that's often because of high levels of risk. So looking at woodworking, woodworking can be a great business because it can be started for little to no capital. There are people out there going and just picking up free pallets and making something out of them and selling them. That's called low risk. Um, if you're already building things, you most likely have all the tools that you need to keep building things. So don't go crazy. Make stuff. Put it out there and see if it sells. You don't need to make crazy investments in expensive equipment in the beginning or go and lease out a huge warehouse because of the what-if potential. Just make some things and see if you can sell them. People might be telling you that they love your work and it's very cool, but when actually asked to part with their money, it might not happen. So it's very important to test the waters and see if you can get some solid sales. If you don't, eh, you didn't risk too much. You tried, move on to something else. So now that you've been selling your stuff and you feel you can make a business out of this, you're excited. But it really is time for restraint. One of the very first businesses that I started in college was a small multimedia company. We did advertising, photography, videography, and this rich guy wanted to invest in our company. So of course, right away, we were asking him to buy us a multi-million dollar building so that we could build it out a film studio and blah, blah, blah. It was stupid. We let the excitement of the growth opportunity cloud our judgment and make us think that we were really at step 50 when we were actually at step five. You can get the future in your head so much that you convince yourself that we're going to grow so fast, we might as well rent out that warehouse now. Or oh, we need to buy this big expensive machine now because we're going to need it anyway soon. Let's just, let's just do it now. Keep yourself grounded. If the phrase is pretty soon and not I need it yesterday, don't do it. Use the excitement of your new venture to fuel you to work hard. Put in those long hours, but stay lean and let the money dictate your growth. When you can't keep up with demand in your small space, you're obviously pulling in the money. Then you can afford to rent a bigger space. When you have so many orders that your CNC machine is backed up for a week, then it's time to buy a second one or a bigger one. Have restraint and the growth will come at the right time. So, okay, you're selling things now. What's the right path for you to grow this further? Are you a mass production person that makes a small number of items for sale on Etsy? Or are you a commissioned artist that when a client comes to you and says, make me a chair, you make them a chair, or make me a table, or make me a bar top? Uh, or are you a woodworking contractor making built-in bookcases with wonderful moldings and alternating between your shop and then installing the product at the client's location? It's important that you do your research and see if it's a model that fits for you. A commission builder can make a much higher profit margin, but Work might be occasional, and how are you going to drum up more work? What will people be asking you to make? Maybe it's outside of your comfort zone. Will you be able to deal with that? Um, with mass-produced work, are you going to be able to enjoy that? I bought my CNC machine with the idea that I had a product that I wanted to make, and selling that product will pay for the machine. I figure I'll sit, stick a piece of wood in the machine, and five minutes later, it spits out money. Surprise, that's not how it works. So if you want to make money in high volume production, you have to be present every 45 minutes to put in a new piece of wood and then you have to take those pieces, 
finish them, um, stain them, all sorts of stuff. It's a huge time commitment in order to make a decent income from it. So maybe that's for you, maybe it's not. Perhaps you're a mix of it all, taking commissions and then filling the time in between with mass made items. Regardless of how you choose to operate, make sure you understand it and focus. Being unfocused and running in all different directions all the time means that you're just gonna spread yourself too thin. You need to succeed by focusing on your main core product. Growing it, nurturing it, will help you to get to success faster. People first think about how much I should charge for something. That is the wrong question. The first question, that's the correct one, is how much is this going to cost me? I cannot stress this enough that this is the most important part of the video and for your business. I can't tell you how many times I've done some consulting work and people think they have a handle on all their expenses and they think they're making 25% in profit. And then we take a look at everything and see, well, what about this? What about that? And then once all of the expenses are added, now they're only at 10 or 15% profit. Maybe even the business isn't even making any money. Um, I've had some good friends that were interested in starting a business and so I offered to take a look at everything for them and you know maybe I can give them some pointers. Everything sounded great until we got to the point where they were saying they were manufacturing packaging in China and importing it and I asked well how much is shipping going to be and they had guessed and put a, a, a small number on there. They didn't understand that shipping was going to be an incredibly expensive part of the process and that when you add things in like tariffs and customs, it completely made the business unprofitable. So it wasn't something that they were gonna go for. So it's important to understand where all your expenses off. So first off, don't just write this down on a piece of paper, make a spreadsheet. Use an online solution, um, use estimating software, something. It needs to be digital. And you need to be very diligent and precise during this process. It will really make it easy for you to do estimates going forward. I'm going to make a very basic version of this. Uh, you'll see throughout the video, and I will have it for download for free. There will be a link for it in the description of this video. Um, again, it's very basic. I list like an expense as wood. You need to expand upon that and say each of the different types of woods and different dimensions and their prices and stuff. But um, <laughs> uh, I just wanted to put it out there for you. Also, this is just one day to do this. I don't know your business and it might not work for you, but you know, please take the advice from this for what it is. So how do we find out all of our total expenses? Let's break it up into a couple different groups to make it easier. Your first group is gonna be the easiest, which is the direct cost of the materials for the job that you're gonna do. That's your lumber, screws, hardware, et cetera. Um, all the things that you're gonna go up to the store now and purchase for this particular job. So let's call this our hard project costs. The next section is all of your disposables. These are things that you're gonna buy that will last for multiple jobs, but ultimately will be used up and have to be purchased again, such as glue, rags, stains and finishes, saw blades and router bits, those wear out. Um, craft paper and sandpaper and paint brushes and even paper towels. The, the list goes on. You really should walk around your shop and literally record every single thing that you have in here that you use. The tricky part is figuring out how to divide each of these expenses so that you can issue them a value for every job that you're doing. So uh, let's do something easy like uh, a box of popsicle sticks or tongue depressors for mixing things. Um, you can take the total number that's in that box and divide it by the cost that you bought it for and then it'll tell you how much each stick is. So let's say each stick is 10 cents. Now every time you do a job that requires this, you can attribute 10 cents to that job. Something harder might be a router bit that you pay $50 for. Um, you need to come up with an idea of how long it will last. Maybe it will stay sharp and accurate for 50 jobs. Not cuts, but full jobs. So that would give it a value of $1 per job. And this is a basic example. This section is gonna take some time and though it isn't gonna be easy, make sure you take your time on it. As you run your business, you should revisit these numbers every once in a while to make sure they're up to date and also to give them a more realistic view of what they should be. Maybe that router bit is lasting you 100 jobs or 200 jobs instead of the 50 that you originally thought. 
The next section is your long-term expenses. This one also requires a lot of thought and there may be some gray area things, but you should always attribute them to your business. A great example is electricity. If you're getting very serious about this business, you have to expect that you're going to be out here for long hours running all of your shop tools all the time, and those are power hogs. Now, if you're like me and you're doing it in a home shop, you're just saying, well, I pay my utility bill by me personally. Yes. Um, but it's still an addition to the bill that I have to pay, whether it's coming out of my business account or my personal account, it's all my money. So you just need to factor in the increase in electricity um, and then divide it out for each one of your jobs so that you know, you're paying for it. Of course, you have equipment repairs and failures that are going to happen. You're going to be using your equipment heavily, so those things have to be factored in. Um, in fact, you should be trying to run a slush fund for new equipment or replacements. Every year, if you're lucky, if everything works fine, um, then you can take that money and buy that new tool that you've really been wanting to. Or maybe just take your family on a vacation, but you should have money put aside for this. Uh, another one is garbage. Uh, this is one that people rarely think about. Of course, we all do the whole bonfire thing where we take all our scrap wood and we burn it. Um, some people even sell their hardwood cutoffs on Marketplace. There's a guy that sells it near me for $5 for a bucket. So he's making profit off of the garbage instead of an expense. And while that's fine, when you're small, once you really start producing a large volume of garbage because you're doing a lot of work, um, it becomes too much of a hassle. I don't want to be answering 20 is it available, is it available, is it available messages on Facebook Messenger all day when I have 30 things to do in my shop. Um, so for garbage at a certain point you're just going to need to get a dumpster. Um, I always tell people to treat it as a badge of honor. Um, all right, my business has grown to where I have to buy a garbage dumpster. Yes, I did it. Um, you know, but once that happens, you do have to factor that into your estimations. This section is going to just have a lot of guesswork in the beginning because you don't know, but you do need to put values in here. Um, the big important thing to do is to revisit it frequently. Once you've been running your business for a few months, you will have the data from paying all of your bills to come back and revise all of these numbers. For one of my contracting businesses, I literally use this spreadsheet exactly as it is, and every single year I go completely down the line and revisit every single number. We all know how COVID has made prices crazy, and so failing to update this list could really mislead you on how much money you're making. The very last part of this expense sheet should be labeled other, and that is your miscellaneous other items that are attributed specifically to your business. Now, I'm going to assume that most people starting a small woodworking business are doing it on their own without employees, at least for a while. Money should dictate getting those employees. However, you might have other outsourced expenses. For example, I am horrible at painting. I hate it. And I hate when I spend a ton of time working on something and I make this beautiful product and then I screw it up because the paint job looks bad. So, I have just accepted that and I have a person that I pay to paint my stuff for me and they do a really great job. I just factor that into my estimation process. I don't make any less money. Um, it does drive my prices to the customers a teeny bit higher, but you know what? I'm putting out a higher quality product. Um, other things in here might be your gas and wear and tear on your vehicle. If you're somebody who's traveling to install things or maybe deliver a product. A friend of mine does cabinet refinishing. She needs to factor on several trips in her vehicle, taking the cabinet faces off, taking them back to her shop, working on them, painting them, taking them back again. Oh, there's an issue. Go back home, do this, come back again. Um, so perhaps a good way to look at this is to come up with a value for what a trip costs you. And so then when you're doing an estimate for a new job, you might look at it and say, I'm going to have to make six trips. So you times that value by six in your estimate. Even think of things like printer ink and paper. It all adds up, so get everything in here. Advertising is another one, but we're going to deal with that in a later part of this video. Insurance is also definitely one to consider. Um, I know that people in the beginning are not going to spend the money on insurance, but at a certain point, um, you run into personal jeopardy if you don't have some sort of just even small insurance. And then especially if you're going to bring anyone else to work in your shop, I have had in my businesses 
first day employees that have gone to the hospital. And then you land in legal trouble if you don't have insurance at that point. So bear that in mind. If you're ever going to bring employees in, that is definitely something you want to have in place before they walk into your shop for the first time. What to charge? So if you jumped ahead in the video to this section, don't do it. You need to go back and watch the expense section first because otherwise none of this is gonna make sense, okay? Go back and watch that section first. Um, everybody wants to know this, so I know people are gonna jump forward. So when you feel you have every little expense in there, now we can look at pricing your jobs. The great part is that we get to work off the exact same form and figuring out your pricing should be fairly easy. What we're going to look at first is your long-term expenses. The long-term expenses, we just want to divide them by what your anticipated number of jobs is going to be this month. And I know that can be hard when you're beginning, but if you're going to do 100 jobs this month, then $400 in bills divided by 100 would be $4, that you're just going to add $4 to every single job when you do an estimate for it. That way it covers those bills. Next, we need to look at every single item from top to bottom on this list and assign it a multiple. Some things just might be a multiple of one. You know, you're charging for what you paid for if you're not multiplying it. So um, let's say I paid for that outside laborer to paint my stuff. I'm just passing that bill along to the customer. I'm not gonna be greedy and mark it up. So I'm just assigning it a value of one. Um, some things also you just don't feel like upcharging like glue. But the main items you're building with, you're going to want to assign multiples based on how hard the work is. So let's give a good example. Let's pretend we're going to make a river table with some weird drawers underneath. Just roll with it, right? Um, I have to make a mold out of melamine first, and that's really easy. I'm just taking a sheet of melamine and then ripping a couple pieces to make uh, walls around it. So the cost of the melamine is $46. Maybe I multiply that by two and a half times. So I'd be charging $115 for the making of this mold. So I'm breaking down the, pro the whole project into processes. I'd be making $69 in the process of making the mold. The same for like Tyvek tape and silicon. I'm gonna multiply those by two and a half. But then we get to harder stuff like the epoxy pour. You know, you have to be skilled to do that. It's going to be harder. Um, you have to cut it afterwards, sand it, polish it, a whole bunch of stuff. So maybe we're going to take the cost of epoxy and multiply it by four, five, or ten times. Um, by assigning multiples based on how hard the work is, you can fairly and accurately price based on the difficulty of the individual parts of your job. Obviously, you want to take into account the cost of an item that's you know, very expensive. Multiplying a custom thousand dollar steel leg assembly that you had made for this project, um, you know, you need to make your multiplication very low. You don't want to gouge the customer. Um, but you may even want to break out certain actions into flat additional charges. So something like, uh, you know, we're going to make drawers for this weird table that I'm talking about. And, uh, you know, my standard drawers are in the fee, but if you would like me to make dovetails, I'm going to add, you know, $75 per drawer as a flat fee in addition. Um, you know, some things you're going to want to play around with flat fees and other things you just work on multiples. Once you have this whole spreadsheet filled out with the expenses and then your multiples, this is your estimate sheet. It becomes very easy for a contractor or commission worker to use this as their estimator. You can now go down the line when you're doing an estimate and just click like, okay, I need two brushes. I need one portion of glue. No, no, I need, this is a bigger job, two portions of glue. Uh, I need six different grits of sandpaper. Everything's in a line. So you just go down the line and you can easily fill it out. At the end, it's going to tally it all up for you and tell you how much to charge. It's also going to tell you how much you made in profit and how much you're going to have to outlay to buy everything. This becomes your formula. And it's going to take some time, but once you tweak it to where you're happy with those results, stick to it. It won't let you down. For mass production work, this is a little bit different. This sheet can tell you if you can make money on an item, not how much to price it. If your item is truly original and nobody else makes anything like it, you can charge whatever the market allows, what people are willing to pay for it. But if you're selling on Etsy a Christmas sign, for example, and there's oodles of them, right? 
Your design may be unique, but you're really limited in your pricing. There are tons of those signs on there and you have to look at what everybody's charging. Um, I just took a look for this example from 15 to $200. Um, and so you have to fit in that window. If you're outside of that window, you might have a cool design, but there's easier and cheaper options a click away. So um, this can be a problem for you. So plug in all of your numbers into this sheet and truly understand the total cost of your item down to the penny. Make sure you're factoring on shipping costs, the box, the packing material, the label, the ink for the printer that you're gonna print out on there and driving over to the post office to drop this off. And of course, you have to take care of Etsy's cut that they're gonna take out of your product. So let's say after all that, it's gonna cost you $35 to make this sign with all of that factored. Then pricing it in line with other Etsy sellers, you feel maybe you'll be able to sell it for $95. That means you're bringing in $60 of profit per sign. Is that enough for you for the amount of work you did? If it is, great. Um, you might find that when you do this exercise, you're gonna look at it and say, oh, I'm gonna make $10 a sign. That took me a long time and a lot of effort to make it for $10. Maybe it's not worth it at that point. So um, this shit becomes a way to find your true profit on those items and decide if the time versus profit value is worth it on a mass production scale. Now that you know you're charging a reasonable price for your work, what if the person wants to haggle with you? Honestly, I hate this and I really don't tolerate it. Um, you've spent time coming up with a reasonable price that values your work and then people are saying, no, your work isn't worth that price. Don't undersell yourself. So how do you deal with this? Um, personally, I stand firm and I try to complicate their decision making. I do this by saying, well, if your budget doesn't fit with this, we could definitely go with a cheaper material to use. It won't be as nice, but you know, it'll bring the price down to something you're more comfortable with. Or we could take away some features to lower the price. These are things that they don't want to do. So you're putting the decision making back on them to decide that no, your price is worth it because they want those things. They'll go ahead and pay the price you're asking. This is just a little Jedi mind trick. It, it works a lot, trust me. Um, also, once you've figured out your formula with the sheet above, don't be afraid to tell somebody a very, very large number. I have a business that I own that is very expensive to my customers. I really only cater to affluent people with this one. Um, on my very first estimate long ago, um, when I went and I gave the customer an estimate, I plugged in all the numbers into my spreadsheet and it says that I should charge him $15,000. I was beside myself. I'm like, I can't tell this guy this number. Um, he's gonna laugh in my face, no way. So I took $3,000 off and I told him it's gonna be 12,000. Without skipping two seconds, he pulled out his checkbook, wrote an entire $12,000 check, not even the little deposit I wanted, he wrote the whole thing. If I had just told him the 15,000, that's what would have been on the check. If you're pricing your stuff realistically and honestly, and your formula tells you that you need to charge them a large amount, well, that's what's required for this project. Believe in yourself and believe in your business. Don't be afraid to give them the big number. On commission and contracting work, you always need to take a non-refundable deposit, period. That's it. Um, this deposit should be for at least 10% more than what all of your costs are going to be. So look at your estimate sheet and at the bottom it tells you this is how much you're spending on this project. Charge 10% more than that. That way if the job goes south, um, you are covering all of your purchases and operating expenses. Now for charging for estimates, that's a very subjective thing. However, um, I would say that especially with the varying prices of lumber, there can be a lot of added estimate time nowadays because you can't just have a, a list and say like, oh, okay, when I buy heartwood, it costs me this much and so I'm just gonna go off that number. No way, you, for every single job you're doing, you need to get prices and those prices are only gonna be good for a couple days because it's gonna completely change tomorrow. So um, if somebody is coming to you with a really large job that is going to take you a long time to get the estimate out, charge for it. Tell them like, hey, I'm gonna need to take a $50 
estimate fee. It's non-refundable. If you book with me, then we attribute that $50 towards the cost of the job. It's not a ton of money, so it shouldn't push somebody off if it's a really big job. Uh, $50 isn't much, but at least you're not just spinning your wheels and wasting your time going out there. Um, you know, there's definitely lots of people that'll come up to you and be like, I want to have an estimate for this crazy so-and-so. Make me an Eiffel Tower Art of Marbles. Well, and they have no intention of doing it. Um, so if you get that feeling too, if you get the person that's just wasting your time, throw that $50 fee on there. They'll backpedal and then you didn't waste your time. Um, on another one of my businesses, I let people know that uh, I have a minimum. And that's because I get lots of people who contact me and I can only take on so many jobs at a time. So um, I let people know this minimum, that that's the smallest job that I undertake. And immediately you can tell in their voice if, uh, oh, that's way too much for me. Thank you very much. I'll talk to you later. Goodbye. And again, I didn't waste my time. Or the person's like, okay, yeah, let's, let's talk about it. That immediately tells you, okay, this is a deal. Reel them in, buddy. Like, let's take this client seriously. So the, those are just a couple different tips. Obviously, you can approach things differently. But I've been in business for 25 years now. Um, and so being my own business owner, you have to sell yourself all the time. And when I get really busy, I don't want to waste my time. So some of those tactics, um, you know, are a good way to not insult the customer, but, you know, maybe shuffle off some less interested people so it just doesn't waste your time. When you're just starting out on your new business, it's very important to drum up as much business as possible. Advertising is a great way to get your name out there. However, it can be expensive, so let's approach this in a very smart way. First off, your social media is a great way to put visuals of your content out there for free. Friend everybody. Friend your friends of your friends of your friends of your friends and get as many people on that friends list as you possibly can. And then put out images of your content. You never know who's going to be interested. Additionally, word of mouth from family and friends is a huge driver for business. Don't be afraid to let all of your friends know that you've decided to take this leap in your life and start doing your own business. And you'd really appreciate it if they would let other people know about it. You're not asking them to spend money. You're, you're not asking too much of them to, to ask them of this. Now, a very cheap advertising that you can do is social media advertisements or Google AdWords. And when I talk about cheap, you could decide to spend $2 a day. Some of these services even have coupon codes where you can get $100 worth of free advertising when you sign up for the first time. So, of course, you need to do that. Um, I've used Google AdWords many, many times, and you can definitely laser focus the criteria of who is going to see your website link. First, geographically, you can say, I only want uh, the ad to show to people who live within a half an hour radius of my house. Then you could narrow that down even further and say, my primary customer is women 30 to 65. And then even throw in a financial bracket if you want. If your product is very high end and expensive, you need to tailor those ads to people who make a lot of money. The less you're going to spend on the advertising, the more you should be very specific in the criteria of who sees it. That way the right person is seeing it every single time. It's only going to show once or twice a day, so you want to make sure it gets to the right person. For my seasonal Christmas light business that I own, we advertise during that season heavily. But the rest of the year, I spend $5 a day just running my ad. And I'll get random jobs here and there from people who want us to come decorate their homes for a party or a wedding or something else. That's actually a lot of extra income, and getting one of those jobs during my off-season more than pays for all that advertising that I did. So don't feel like you can't afford advertising. Skip that Starbucks coffee today and spend that $5 on advertising that could really benefit your business. Finally, you need to keep building for you. If you are in the woodworking space, it's because you enjoy the art form. I can't tell you how many things I've created for my wife that then people see and everybody wants it. So when you create things that you like, that interest you, that interest your family, um, you know, they can actually become new parts of your business going forward. And of course, when you get really busy, this becomes hard because 
you do want to make sure that you're still enjoying this and it's not just a full-time job and you get tired of it, you know? Um, I hope that you've enjoyed this video and hopefully I've been able to give you some useful information. I can't stress it enough how important it is to dig deep and really fully understand your expenses. Expenses. Make sure you have that right. What I said might not work 100% for you, but hopefully I can give you some guidance out of this and hopefully it's something that you'll be able to apply towards your own business. So um, I hope you'll like and subscribe to the channel. It's only three weeks old, so your likes and subscriptions are really what are gonna help me build this channel, continue bringing videos like this one. I wish you best of luck in your future business. And of course, stay safe in the shop. I'll see you in the next video.